Welcome to episode 33 of Real Health Radio. You can find the show notes and the links talked about in this episode at www.seven-health.com forward slash 33. Welcome to Real Health Radio. Health advice that's more than just about how you look. And here's your host, Chris Sandel. Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of Real Health Radio. Uh, This is another solo show where it's just me riffing on a particular topic and this week's topic is carbohydrates. So over the next couple of podcasts I'll probably do a similar thing with protein and then with fat but I wanted to start out with carbs. And carbohydrates seem to have taken a real bashing probably for the last decade, probably a little bit longer than that. While in, say, the 1980s, the 1990s, fat was enemy number one, carbohydrates um, kind of taken over that mantle probably from the early 2000s with the proliferation of the Atkins diet, and then since then with further diets like paleo largely flying the low-carb flag. So what I want to do as part of the show is talk about what carbohydrates are used for in the body, what are the different dietary sources, because I know a lot of the time when people hear the word carbs, they instantly think of bread and pasta, and that's kind of all they think about. And then what are my preferences in terms of um, the different forms of carbohydrates? And this is going to be based on scientific stuff, but also based on what I've seen from working with different clients. So let's start with what are carbohydrates used for within the body? Um, First and foremost, carbohydrates are all about energy. This is energy so you can run and think, but also energy to run your various systems and organs. And when you eat carbohydrates, you digest them into simple sugars like fructose and glucose, and these sugars then make their way into your blood and then make their way into your cells to be converted into ATP, which is cellular energy. And As I go through this podcast, I'm going to use the words carbs and sugars interchangeably. So if you hear the word sugar, don't instantly think of white table sugar. Just think of carbohydrates. And I'm going to recover uh, later on refined carbohydrates like chocolates and confectionery. Um, But for the most part, as I go through this, when I say sugar, I mean carbohydrates. So carbohydrates in most cases are the body's preferred energy source. And I say in most cases because it really does depend on different organs and systems and what energy sources they want to use or what are their preferences. So for example, the heart has a preference for saturated fat and uses this as an energy source more than anything else. And the intensity of what is going on within your life at certain points also dictates the preference for different energies. So for example, during times of rest, so when you're sleeping, fat is used more of a, uh, as an energy source or as a preference over carbohydrates. But despite all this, carbohydrates are largely the cell's preferred energy source. And in particular, they're needed for the central nervous system, for the kidneys, for the brain, for the muscles, which also includes the heart, uh, to function properly. And I would extend this list to basically all systems and all organs, but these are the ones where carbohydrates are of the utmost importance. And some cells, such as red blood cells, are only able to produce cellular energy when um, getting glucose. And the brain is also highly sensitive to low blood glucose levels, and this is because it uses glucose and really glucose only to produce energy and for it to function properly. And this is unless someone's in some extreme starvation conditions. So glucose for brain function is really important. And when you look at how much our brain weighs and the size of it versus how much glucose it actually uses, it uses a huge percentage of the body's glucose uh, supplies. And I don't want to get too bogged down in the intricacies of carbohydrate metabolism and the creation of ATP, but if you compare the ATP production from carbohydrates versus fat versus protein, um, carbohydrates produces a much higher amount of carbon dioxide at the point that it's producing that ATP. And this is important because while most people think of carbon dioxide as a waste product that you just breathe out, it's actually much more important than this. 
It's needed as part of proper cell functioning. It helps to balance electrolytes. It's anti-inflammatory. It inhibits stress. It supports the immune system and liver function. And importantly, it helps your cells to take up and use oxygen. So it's actually the carbon dioxide that allows for the exchange of oxygen within the cells. And without adequate carbon dioxide, adequate oxygen can't get in because cells breathe in and breathe out the same way that we breathe in and breathe out. So increasing cellular carbon dioxide production, which is what carbohydrates does more than fat or more than protein, is important for proper health. Um, Some glucose, when it's taken in, is converted to ribose and uh, deoxoribose, uh, which are essential building blocks of important macromolecules, so things like RNA and DNA, and glucose is additionally utilized to make the molecule a, uh, NADPH, uh, which is important for the protection against oxidative stress and is used for many other chemical reactions within the body. Um, Carbon dioxide are also important for intestinal health and for, for waste elimination from the body. And carbohydrates do this by providing the body with different types of fiber. So some of the fiber is um, undigestible, but it helps to provide bulk to our digestive tract, helping to move things through and with transit, um, and also adding bulk to our stool so they can be passed out of the body. Um, something like raw carrots is a great example of this, as they're not digested particularly well, but they actually help to balance out things like endotoxin and LPS, and with the excretion of different types of hormones like estrogen from the body. And it does this because we can't break down the fiber in the carrots very well, but it has these other functions. There's other types of fiber that can also be largely undigestible to us, uh, but actually provide a good source of food and energy for our gut bacteria. And this would be things like prebiotic foods um, that can help with the proliferation of beneficial bacteria, mostly within the colon. Um, Carbohydrates are also protein sparing and help with muscle creation. So protein can be used for many different things within the body. And if it has to, it can also be used as an energy source. But really, its ability is best used in other ways. So by providing the body with adequate amounts of carbohydrate, protein can then be spared for being used as an energy source, and it can therefore do lots of its other important functions. And one of those would be, say, building muscle. And adequate carbohydrate is also needed for testosterone production. And again, this is then helpful with building muscle and muscle production. And testosterone is not just for that. It has lots of different functions within the body. And if you're a woman and you're listening to this and thinking, oh, gosh, this is going to mean that I'm going to bulk up and get all muscly, it's very unlikely that this is going to happen unless you're really hitting it up at the gym and also your body is that way inclined. Um, And while testosterone is thought about as a a male hormone, it is produced by both men and women, and it's needed for health in both sexes. And men just uh, uh, produce it in much higher amounts, just like men and women both produce estrogen and progesterone, but women just produce those in higher amounts. Um, When you eat carbohydrates, not all of it is immediately used for energy, and some of it can be stored in the muscles and also in the liver to be used later on. And the body does this by converting the sugars into a substance called glycogen. And glycogen, as I said, it's stored in the muscles and also in the liver, and the glycogen that's stored in your muscles is mostly used by your muscles, and the glycogen that is stored in your liver can then be used wherever it needs to in the body, and it can be shuttled around often for the brain and the nervous nervous system using the most of it. So what happens is when you run out of the last meal that you've just eaten, or you find yourself, say, in an emergency situation where you suddenly need a lot more energy, your body then releases a hormone called adrenaline. And adrenaline causes the release of another hormone called glucagon. And this is a hormone that is released from the pancreas. And glucagon then converts glycogen back into glucose. And so that then goes back into your blood and then through your blood goes into your cells to be then turned into ATP and used as energy. And our body only has a limited supply of glycogen. 
and you've probably heard of marathon runners talking about uh, hitting the wall, uh, and for cyclists, the term is uh, bonking. And in these situations, they suddenly feel like extreme fatigue and a real decrease in performance. And this is happening because the glycogen stores have now been depleted and have run out. And this weakening of muscle sets in because it takes much longer uh, to transform the chemical energy in fatty acids and also in protein into usable energy in comparison to glucose. So after you've done really prolonged exercise, the glycogen is then gone and then your muscles are now having to rely on the, the fats or the lipids and the proteins as an energy source. And under times of real intense exercise, these are nowhere near, near as good sources of energy as carbohydrates or glucose or glycogen is. Um, but even outside of intense endurance exercise, having adequate glycogen storage is really important. And lots of clients who I work with are in a pretty bad way often when we start together. And as part of this, they have very low amounts or very poor amounts of glycogen storage. And what it means is that they barely have any reserve. So when they run out of the meal that they've just eaten, they don't really have much to fall back on. And so then their body is instantly trying to use fat or protein as an energy source. And it's basically forcing the body to become catabolic and be breaking itself down just so they can keep going. And so this is not a good place for someone to be in day after day. And what I would say as well is it's often portrayed that glycogen storage happens very easily, um, and this isn't always the case. If you have high amounts of insulin, it will prevent glycogen storage. And having insulin go up after a meal and then back down again, that's not really a problem. That's pretty much what happens within the body when it's working well. The issue is for people who are constantly having high amounts of insulin going on. So things like uh, insulin insensitivity issues, so insulin resistance, syndrome X, diabetes, that kind of thing. Um, glycogen storage is also prevented if there is high amounts of stress hormones, so things like adrenaline or cortisol. And it's these hormones, particularly the adrenaline, that is pulling glycogen out of storage and pulling it out of the, the liver and the muscles to be used for energy. So if those hormones are always high, then it's going to prevent glycogen from being stored in the first place. Um, if someone's having inadequate amounts of carbohydrates or inadequate amounts of calories, this is also going to prevent glycogen storage. So in this case, there's just not enough coming in to meet the current demand. So the thought of storing anything extra for later on, it just isn't a priority because it needs to be used now. And so this can also be happening regardless of how much someone weighs. It will depend on what they're eating in that moment to moment or day after day, etc. So this kind of scenario isn't just restricted to those who look visibly thin or malnourished. And so because of the importance of carbohydrates and glycogen, um, it's really important to be taking in the right amounts. And when you are taking adequate amounts, it can then be helping for things like endurance and your ability to train at a higher intensity. So from an exercise perspective, it can be really beneficial. But I'd say it's not just about training at a high intensity, but also living a fairly full-on or intense life. And so many of the people who I work with and so many people just in the, the everyday, day-to-day, -day, are working such long days and are working in very mentally demanding jobs. And this often uh, requires just really decent amounts of carbohydrates to make this work. You don't just use calories and you don't just use carbohydrates when you're being physical. You can be using huge amounts just from thinking. And as I said, the brain uses such a, a high amount. Um, because it has such a preference for glucose as its energy source. And that's why carbohydrates can be so important in these stressful situations. And it, it makes me think of the bit of research that was done, um, which was in part of like one of my favorite books uh, called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by Robert Sulpowski. Um, and I'll quote from the book. He says, you can have two humans and they're taking part in some human ritual. They're sitting there silently at a table. They make no eye contact, they're still, yet every now and then one of them does something, nothing more taxing than lifting an arm and pushing a little piece of wood on a board. And if it's the right wood, and the right chess grandmasters are in the middle of a tournament, 
they are going through 6,000 and 7,000 calories a day, thinking and turning on a massive psychological stress response simply with thought and doing the same thing with their bodies as if they were some baboon who's just ripped open the stomach of their worst rival. And it's all with thought and memories and emotions. So while your day-to-day job might not be as mentally taxing as a chess grandmaster in the middle of a tournament, thinking that you only need to eat a small amount today, whether that be a small amount of calories or a small amount of carbohydrates, because maybe you didn't exercise because you were working 12 hours a day in an office, this isn't the right approach. You're still going to be using a hell of a lot of calories if you're doing a job like that that's taking up a lot of hours and a lot of mental um working out. So that brings the close to the the functions of of carbohydrates, but I now want to look at the different types. So carbohydrates can be split into two categories. So you can have complex carbohydrates and you can have simple carbohydrates. So complex carbohydrates, uh, also known as starches, contain lots of sugars that are tightly bound together, known as polysaccharides. And to be used as energy, these long chains of sugars then need to be broken down to single sugars so they can be uh, used in the cell to be turned into ATP. So they typically digest more slowly and they provide the body with a steadier source of energy. And this isn't always the case. And the the idea of energy longevity and carbohydrates is something I'm going to cover in a bit. But in a general sense, complex carbohydrates digest more slowly and provide steadier energy. And foods that fall into complex carbohydrates um, would be root vegetables. So things like potatoes and sweet potatoes and carrots, parsnips, uh, pumpkin, beetroot, that kind of thing. Um, It would include whole grains, so things like bread and rice and pasta, oats, barley, etc. Beans, pulses, legumes, um, and would also include then above ground vegetables as well. So corn, broccoli, cauliflower, courgettes, that kind of thing. Um, Simple carbohydrates is the other category, and these contain short uh, single or double sugar change, so known as monosaccharides or disaccharides. So mono meaning one, di meaning two. And this means that they are much more easily absorbed and enter the bloodstream quicker. Um, In terms of examples, fruit is the most common natural form of this kind of carbohydrate, um, as well as uh, fruit juices and dried fruits. Uh, Milk would also fall into this category of simple carbohydrate, although it contains protein and fat as well. Uh, natural sugars, so things like honey, maple syrup, blackstrap molasses, coconut sugar, those kind of things all fall into this category, as well as then the things that most people think about when they hear the word simple sugar. So table sugar, high fructose corn syrup, biscuits, cakes, soft drinks, confectionery type stuff. So if I'm then looking at like my best sources of carbohydrates or what are my preferences, It would be things like uh, root vegetables and fruits, um, particularly tropical fruits and some dried fruits. And these foods are high in carbohydrates, making them then a great source of energy. Um, They're also pretty easy on digestion. So if root vegetables are cooked well, whether that be roasted for a long time or boiled for a long time, they're really easy to digest. When fruits are very ripe or for certain fruits, they're cooked as well. It makes them very easy to digest. And foods are only as good as you're able to digest them. So going for things that are easier to digest is a lot of what I do when I'm starting out with people, especially if someone's not in such great health, because I want to create as less burden on the digestive system as possible and have them be able to digest that food. Um, I would say then alongside the root vegetables and the fruit, Um, I like white rice as a carbohydrate source, um, very high in carbohydrates, and it's generally well-tolerated and easy to digest. And you may be thinking, why am I not recommending brown rice, considering it has a higher nutrient content? Um, And brown rice does have a higher nutrient content, but uh, this is in the, the bran layer or the outside of the rice, and this is often difficult to digest. And I find that brown rice is less well-tolerated and digested um, with a lot of people. 
And again, obviously this is an individual thing, but in the beginning when I'm starting with someone and trying to improve their health, digestion can often be impaired. And so my focus is on digestible foods, and this often means white rice over brown rice. And this is an important thing to remember. Just because a nutrient is in a food doesn't mean that you are going to absorb it when you eat it. You only get out of a food what you can actually digest. And people focus, from my perspective, way too much on how many vitamins a certain food has in it with then little regard for how much they're actually able to get out and digest from that stuff. And like kale, I think, is the perfect example. Kale, gram for gram, probably has more nutrients in it uh, than any other food. The problem is kale is incredibly difficult for the body to digest. We are not ruminant animals, and we don't possess the capability to break down uh, cellulose, uh, which kale is incredibly high in. So while it might be full of nutrients, our ability to actually get all of those nutrients out is limited. And it's the same thing, as I said, when looking at brown rice versus white rice, and it's why in the beginning I'm getting people to go for easier to digest foods. Um, above ground vegetables are also obviously a source of carbohydrates, but they're not so high on my list as a carbohydrate source. So they're typically pretty low in calories. They're also typically pretty low as carbohydrates. They're also often tougher on digestion than the fruits or the root vegetables. And this, this means that they can take a larger amount of calories to digest, but don't give so much back in return. Does this then mean that you shouldn't be eating them? Of course it doesn't. And I just suggest that if you are going to be having them, so if you're going to be having some broccoli or you're going to be having some cauliflower or some kale or that kind of thing, that you then pair it with some better form of carbohydrate as part of that meal. So you're going to get lots of vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients, etc., from those above ground vegetables. They're just going to be a little bit more lacking in terms of calories and carbohydrates. But if you can have them with, say, a little bit of rice or some potatoes or some squash or that kind of thing, you can then make up for whatever inadequacies there are there. Um, the other suggestion I would say with above ground vegetables is to cook them well. Uh, there's a tendency for people to lightly steam vegetables or having them as close to raw as possible. And the problem is, again, this can make it more difficult to digest. And so many of the clients that I see who have real problems with bloating and gas and pain and discomfort, when I look through their diet and their food logs, they're predominantly living off lightly steamed vegetables and huge amounts of salads. And so in the beginning, when I'm working with people, I'll often suggest like cook your vegetables like grandma does on Christmas Day, like cooking them within an inch of their life. And yes, this cooking process will lower the vitamin and mineral content, but it will also mean that people are able to digest them well. And as I mentioned before, food is only as good as you're able to digest it. So I start out with people, and it again, it depends on the individual, but getting them to make it as easy to digest as possible, and as their digestion and their health improves, then they can start to be cooking them less and less and be having them slightly firmer or slightly more raw, etc., um, as their digestion allows them to do that. Um, what about then things like refined carbohydrates, so sugar or chocolate or that kind of thing? Really, if there's any one villain that we're blaming all our health woes on and all our problems on at the moment, like sugar is that number one villain. And like fat was blamed in the 80s and 90s, I think sugar is really taking that crown right now. But do I think that that is warranted? Personally, I don't. And honestly, I don't think that there is any one single food to blame for our health problems. And this is where I see a lot of people going wrong, that they think food is like very black and white and, and they really forget about the context. And I don't think that sugar or chocolate or refined foods are inherently bad. It's just how they're used. And there's an idea that I remember from economics when I was at school called opportunity cost. And in simple terms, the opportunity cost is the cost of picking one alternative versus any other option. So let me kind of give an example of how I think about this with sugar. So say in the afternoon time, you decide to have a chocolate bar as your afternoon snack. And this is the only food that you have between lunch and dinner. 
So the opportunity cost of you having that chocolate bar is all the other alternatives that you could have had in its place. So by choosing only the chocolate bar, you're missing out on taking in any real protein as part of that meal. You're also missing out on the opportunity to have any fruits or vegetables. You're missing out on really all the other foods that you could have instead. Now, let's say that instead of just having that chocolate bar in the afternoon, you have a mandarin, a piece of cheese, and a chocolate bar. So in this instance, you're taking in a more substantial snack. It's more well-balanced in terms of the fact that there's some protein there from the yogurt um, and from uh, some protein there, not from, from the yogurt, um, from, from the cheese. Um, it means you've also got some fruit there in terms of the mandarin. So the opportunity cost as part of this meal is less because the snack has provided you with more. And really, this is how I see refined carbohydrates either being okay or causing a problem. Normally, when they're causing a problem, it's because they are being eaten in isolation or it's because they're then displacing other healthy foods from someone's diet. And it's really the missing out of all of these other foods that's the main problem rather than the inherently damaging nature of chocolate or cookies or cake. If sugar is used as part of a healthy diet and is eaten in the context of a healthy diet, then I don't think it's a problem and I think it can be very healthy. And becoming fearful of sugar or refined carbohydrates doesn't help and it's the message that's really being sold at the moment. And if you want to have some chocolate or a muffin or a biscuit, then do so and enjoy it. But just be doing it um, as part of a snack um, or a meal and make sure that it's not displacing large amounts of your other fruits and vegetables and other foods within the diet. Um, in terms of bread and pasta and grains, I mean, this is often the carbohydrates that people are most fearful of as well. And in terms of books like Grain, Bla Ba Grain Brain and Wheat Belly, um, selling huge amounts of copies. And personally, I have no problem with people eating these foods as long as they can tolerate them. So if you eat bread, if you eat pasta, if you have toast and you have no trouble digesting this stuff, then go for it and include it in your diet. And what I would say is that I do often find that people have some difficulty digesting this stuff. And it is fairly common for clients to get some gas or some bloating or some loose stools or some aches and pains um, that then dissipate or improve once they start to lower the amount of bread or pasta or grain consumption. And I'm not saying that this is happening because these people have celiac disease or they're gluten sensitive or they're gluten intolerance, but for whatever reason, they start to do better when they're consuming a little bit less of this stuff. And a couple of things that I would say with this is most of these people seem to have a threshold with it. So if they're having it two or three or four times a week, it's no problem and they're basically symptom free. But as soon as they start having it every day or a couple of day, times a day, that's when they start to get symptoms. And again, like I mentioned with the refined carbohydrates, maybe this isn't because of the bread or the pasta so much, but because of the opportunity costs. And it's meaning that if they're eating more of these foods, they're now having to miss out on the root vegetables or more of the fruits. And this is what's causing the problem. I mean, honestly, I don't know what it is. It's just what I've noticed with working with clients. And the other thing I would say is that often, and this is particularly with like bread and with toast, it doesn't give clients great energy longevity. So they may have some toast as their main carb for breakfast, um, but within an hour or so, they're hungry again or they notice their energy isn't so good. And whereas if they have some fruit or some fruit salad instead of the toast, their energy is longer and, and uh, sorry, is better for longer. And this often isn't because of the extra amounts of carbohydrates. We can have someone having the exact same amount of carbohydrates from toast or having the exact same amount of carbohydrates from fruit, and the fruit just sustains them for longer. And again, this isn't for everyone, but it's happened enough with clients for me to think that it's worth mentioning. So even when someone tolerates, say, bread or toast from a digestive perspective, I'd also add to pay attention to how it affects the energy. And if it works really well for you, then great. Keep eating it. Have it regularly. 
If you're noticing that it's not as good for you from an energy perspective, then either change it up and have something in its place or just add in some other form of carbohydrate alongside it. And this then obviously brings up the area of carbohydrate longevity. And you could have, say, 10 different foods that have the exact same amounts of carbohydrates in them and even the exact same amount of calories. But people will do better or worse on some of them or others from an energy perspective. And so what I want to share is what I've noticed from working with clients. And this isn't particularly scientific, but rather what I've seen in practice. None of this stuff is set in stone and your results will undoubtedly vary, but I just want to give you some ideas about what I've found to be the best forms of carbohydrates from an energy longevity perspective um, and which ones aren't as good. And for the ones that aren't so good, it doesn't mean that they're useless or you shouldn't be eating them or you should be avoiding them. It just means that you probably need to be pairing them with some other form of carbohydrate when you do have them. And with the concept of longevity or the idea of longevity, you could pay attention to certain symptoms. So symptoms like what happens with body temperature, what happens with temperature of the your hands or your feet or the tip of your nose, what's happening with your mood or your emotions, how's your focus, how's your concentration, uh, how long before you're hungry again, how frequently are uh, you, you uh, urinating and what's the color of your urine. And so all of these different symptoms can uh, help to give me or give you a bit of an understanding in terms of longevity as opposed to just focusing solely on how's your energy. So in first place for best carbohydrate in terms of longevity is root vegetables. And these ones seem to be just the best at giving people lasting energy. And this would be things like potatoes and sweet potatoes, um, but it could be any and all of the different root vegetables. And again, it will depend on the situation. So you may find that you have some beetroots and they're not so good, but when you have some parsnips, it works really well. So it will depend on the situation. Um, in terms of second place, I'd probably put white rice. Um, so white rice, not only is it easy to digest, but uh, it's good for keeping people warm and keeping them energized for a long time. And for both of these, so both the the root vegetables and the white rice, it could also be what people typically eat with these foods, which is fat. So if you're having some white rice, you're typically having some olive oil and some butter and maybe some salt through it as well. With the root vegetables, if you roasted them, you probably roasted them some kind of fat. If you're boiling them, you're having them with some kind of butter. So maybe it's not just the carb, but how these carbs are often consumed. Um, in terms of third place, I'd probably put fruit. And this is obviously a very big category with fruit and will very much depend on what fruit we're talking about. So things like mangoes or bananas may be a lot better in comparison to, say, the higher water content fruit like some different melons. Um, in fourth place, I'd probably put things like bread and toast and pasta and then other grains and beans and pulses. And this stuff can be pretty high in terms of carbohydrates, but in terms of energy, it doesn't seem to often keep people as energized or as warm as some of the other earlier options. Um, there are some exceptions to this, and I'll, I'll come back and explain that in a minute. Um, in fifth place, I would put fruit, uh, dried fruit, sorry, and then fruit juices. And this is, can often appear a little strange because if you look on paper for the amount of carbohydrates that are in things like sultanas or some dates, um, they can be extraordinarily high. Um, and you can get a huge amount of carbohydrates for very little eating, so very dense in terms of carbohydrates. But despite this, in practice, they often have lower longevity for people, and people can find themselves kind of tired or hungry um, fairly shortly after eating them. Um, and so this can, again, be different from person to person, but it's often what I find with, with dried fruits. Um, and then in sixth place, I would put something like sugar, which would include things like white sugar, maple syrup, honey, blackstrap molasses, that kind of thing. So a tablespoon or two of this stuff can have very high amounts of carbohydrates, but doesn't seem to last people very long. 
and it might be you're sitting there thinking, well, who's going to have just some simple sugars on their own? Um, you'd be surprised. I've had clients who would use this and were trying to use this as a snack because it did have decent amounts of carbohydrates in them, um, but it doesn't seem to work for them particularly well, which is probably rather unsurprising. And in this list, I haven't included above ground vegetables, and I normally don't consider them great sources of, of carbohydrates from an energy perspective. And so when clients are eating above ground vegetables, they're normally doing it as part of a meal. So they're normally having it, um, sorry, not just as part of a meal, but with other form of carbohydrate with it. So they're having some above ground vegetables with some rice or some potatoes or some pasta or some other form of carbohydrates. And so this makes it hard for me to give a a real accurate estimation based on just these foods. But that would be the rough order that I've noticed from working with clients. And I'd say for you, start to pay attention to your own body. Try out some of these different categories, try out some of these different foods and see what you notice for you. I want to just add a couple of extra thoughts about this. And I would say that Again, this list isn't set in stone. It can differ from person to person. And a really good example of this would be something like porridge. And so about half of the people that I see, um, if they've had porridge for breakfast, it keeps them really warm, it keeps them energized, it keeps them full for hours. It's the, the best thing they can have in the morning and they feel like if they have porridge for breakfast, then they can go all the way through to lunch. For the other half of the people, and I put myself into this category, uh, they do pretty poorly on porridge. So within an hour of having it, they're hungry again, they're cold, they're peeing rather frequently. It just doesn't work for them. So for some, I would say that the grain category, or maybe it's just porridge, could be moving up and be a better source of energy longevity. And for others, it's going to be moving further down. Um, I'd also add that the other foods that you have as part of that snack or meal can then have a real impact as well. So if you have some pasta that you have with just some pesto, it's going to be very different experience from you having some pasta as part of spaghetti bolognese. And this relates then more to the amount of protein and the fat that's in the spaghetti bolognese. And this can obviously change the energy and longevity of the meal. So it's not always just about the carbohydrates. Um, If someone is coming from a intentionally low carbohydrate diet or they've just not been eating things like root vegetables or rice because they thought that they are unhealthy um in the short term as someone reintroduces this stuff it can be a little confusing um and the reason i say this is in these scenarios so someone hasn't been eating this stuff for a while they then have like a jacket potato or something like that for lunch rather than feeling energized, it makes them want to go to sleep. It just totally wipes them out. It makes them want to uh, just crawl up under their desk and and uh, do a George Costanza and catch some, some sleep in the office. Um, typically, what I find, this is very much in the short term. And as they continue to include more of these foods, um, they get to a point where that switches. And so it's no longer making them tired. It's actually giving them good, long, consistent energy after eating it. Um, the final thing that you should be aware of as well just relates to the liquid content within or with the carbohydrates as this can affect people differently. So something like a smoothie um, can be very high in carbohydrates from the fruit and from the dried fruit or some honey or some maple syrup. But because of the high liquid content, it may not work so well for someone. And this can also link into the times of the day. So I know personally, and I know this is the case with lots of clients, like high water content carbohydrates or foods um, like juices or smoothies just aren't great first thing of the day. And it doesn't matter how much carbohydrates or it doesn't matter how many calories is part of that meal if they have a high liquid content in the morning um, within a short space of time, energy's low, feeling cold, urinating frequently, feeling hungry again, it just doesn't work. Whereas in the afternoon time, um, I can have a smoothie and I do really well on it, or I can have some orange juice and I do really well on it, and it has a really positive impact, whereas if I had that in the morning, it, it does the opposite. So with all of this information, I mean, start to learn how you need to then 
adjust your meals based on these suggestions. So for example, you may discover that toast isn't a great source of energy for energy longevity for you. So while you like having eggs on toast in the morning, you decide that you need to add in some extra fruit to actually make it work for you and keep you going longer. And so I suggest thinking about the idea of carbohydrate carbohydrate longevity um, and paying attention to it for yourself. And the order I mentioned may be way off for you. So work out what is and isn't right for you and what's your order. Um, And you can still, again, as I said before, you can still eat all of these different kinds of foods. But it just means that when you are having one of the ones that doesn't give you as good energy for as long, you may need to just pair it with something else to support you better. The final thing I just want to say, if you are really interested in the idea of carbohydrates and how they affect your body and your health, is to read The Low Carb Myth by Ari Witten. Um, It was one of my favorite books from last year and covers basically everything you've ever wanted to know about carbohydrates and insulin and diabetes and basically any topic related to carbohydrate intake and health. Um, It's much more detailed um, and thorough and research focused than I've been in this episode and I wanted this episode to be very accessible and practical, but I highly recommend checking out the book and I really like um, and love Ari Witten's work. So that is it for this week's show. I hope you have a better understanding about carbohydrates. I implore you to put into practice some of the suggestions I've made and try out different forms and see how they work for you and what does and doesn't work. Uh, Next week is another episode where I've got a guest on the show. Uh, It's already been recorded and I know you're going to really love it. So until next week, take care. Thanks for listening to Real Health Radio. If you are interested in more details, you can find them at the Seven Health website. That's www.sevensevenhealth.com.